right, everybody. It's STEM day today. Just so you know, I didn't uh, practice these streamers. This is all live television. I just decided to do it just right here in front of you. Now it's in my water, in my drinking water. That's good. Hey, happy STEM day. This is a special edition of Science in Stuff, the show where we talk about science in stuff. I'm Anna Wenger, the showrunner of Mission Unstoppable, everyone's favorite TV show about the amazing leaders in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. You can catch Mission Unstoppable Saturday mornings on CBS. Today we have not two, not ten, but eleven amazing leaders. Yes, this episode goes to eleven from the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math who will join us to celebrate National STEM Day. See? Happy STEM Day. Um, since these guests are all very interesting and everyone knows I get carried away with all of the talking, we have employed the Mission Unstoppable Dolphin to keep us on track. That's right, uh, when you hear this noise, th that means we need to hurry up and get to our next guest or we won't have time for everyone. And, you know, it is definitely useful to have that dolphin noise because uh, I do tend to go on and on and on. Um, in rehearsal, we said that you'd play the dolphin noise again. Right now. <laughs> well, how long do you want me to vamp? Um, hold on, let me, th this is fun. Here, this is <laughs> just amazing if you want to figure that out. Um, okay, Mich uh, uh, okay, Mission Unstoppable Dolphin. I get it. I'm moving on. That was great. Today's lineup is aquarium biologist Amanda Hodo. Uh, Jacqueline, Jackie, Jacqueline Means, the STEM queen. She actually is a teen. Bat conservationist uh, Kristen Lear. She loves bats. Neuroscientist, thank you so much, Latasia Jones. She's great with brains. Fossil preparator, Miria Perez. That's right, dinosaur bones, people. We have cancer immunologist, Danielle Chum. She's curing cancer. We have the curator of arachnology, Lauren Esposito, who's going to show us some crazy arachnids and insects. We have molecular architect, Helen Tran. We have astrophysicist Aaron McDonald, who actually is working on Star Trek right now. We have soil scientist Yamina Pressler, who's going to tell us the secrets of soil. And we have special makeup effects artist Lydia Morales, who's going to transform me into a crazy scientist instead of just a crazy showrunner. And now it's time for... That's right, everybody. It's everybody's uh, favorite part of the show, science, science newsy news that will impress your friends that you can't stop thinking about even if you wanted to. Here are two things we know for sure. Number one, COVID-19 is the number one worldwide concern of 2020. Number two, dogs rule. Dogs are so amazing. And scientists in the U.S. and the U.K. would agree and are working on ways for dogs to administer COVID tests. And it sure beats a stick up your nose. Although it's really not that bad. I've gotten it done twice. One of them kind of made me sneeze, but honestly, it's no big deal. Dogs detecting illness is actually not a new concept. They do this by smell, as dogs can pick up scents 10,000 times better than humans. They can smell both compounds and chemicals that emit from humans, and over time have been used to detect malaria, infectious bacteria, and even cancer. So it would only be fitting to see if dogs can also smell COVID-19. And it turns out they totally can. In order for these dogs to learn the COVID-19 essence, researchers are using a few different methods. But my favorite is training them with socks that were worn by COVID patients. If dogs could talk, they would indeed tell us that training isn't work for them. It's bliss. Research shows that only after one week of training, dogs can detect positive COVID results at a rate of 83% accuracy, which is not bad, but not yet better than the swab tests, which are between 84 and 98% accurate. Uh, but the dogs do have the edge on wait time because their results are instantaneous. Scientists say that their COVID canines could be ready in as early as six months from now and will be utilized in airports, schools, and other public places. In this reporter's opinion, they should deploy regular dogs to airports, schools, and other public places because I would like to pet them. 
And, no doctor is recommending this, but I think it would also be cute to put them in little lab coats. Wouldn't that be great? Little lab coat doggies in the airport? Um, incredible news coming from Down Under. As a team of Australian scientists from Schmidt Ocean Institute have discovered a reef as large as the Empire State Building in the Great Barrier Reef. I'm a big fan of the ocean, and while I like the old stuff, I'm always excited when the ocean drops a new reef. I mean, aren't we all? The team who found the reef spent a year on, the, on a research vessel mapping the ocean floor, and when they came across it, they were shocked by the discovery as it's, as it's been 120 years since a reef has been discovered at all, which makes us realize that there are still parts of the world that are still unexplored. The reef stood previously undiscovered because at its tallest point, it's still 130 feet below the ocean surface, making it hard to see from above. And of course, the reef extends all the way down to the ocean floor, which is 2,000 feet below. And at its base, it is a whopping mile wide, just like the Empire State Building. That is huge. That is a huge reef. Oh my gosh. The reef is mostly out of reach for recreational scuba diving and extends far deeper than a scuba diver could ever reach. So the scientists sent down a robot named Sub-Bastion, get it, Sub-Bastion, to document the reef. And here are some photos from the journey. Um, there's Sebastian there taking pics. And then this photo is an eel at uh, 534 meters. And then we've got an uh, elephant ear coral at 118 meters. And then at the reef plateau at 49 meters, you can see all the different color corals coming in. It's so pretty. That is so cool. So there's the pics from Sebastian. Um, and I would like to go to that reef. Let's get there. Um, our next story is something we're all familiar with, social distancing. And it turns out we're not the only species to do it. So do vampire bats. Ohio State University researchers in Lamini, Belize, ran a study on how bats behave when they become ill. Look how cute that vampire bat is. In order to conduct this experiment, the researchers studied a colony of 31 vampire bats living inside of a hollow tree. The scientists injected 16 of the bats with a molecule that included a false sickness. That means it'll give them symptoms, but it doesn't really make them sick. And the remaining 15 bats were injected with a placebo. The bats were then all outfitted with GPS trackers that weighed less than a penny and returned to their home. Using the trackers, the scientists were able to detect how the bats socially interacted with each other within their social network. Glad to learn there's a bat social network. Devastated to learn that none of them will accept my friend request. Over the course of a six-hour study, the sick bats interacted with an average of four fewer bat friends than the healthy bats. Overall, the sick bat bats spent 25 minutes less time grooming and communicating with each other than the healthy bats. In conclusion, the sick bats were essentially social distancing themselves from the rest of the colony. We at Science and Stuff have reached out to the leaders of the study to find out if the sick bats also grabbed a blanket and sat on a couch watching the prices right. We'll let you know when we hear more. In conclusion, this reporter has learned that vampire bat colonies seem like a cool place. I'm officially Team Edward now. And that wraps it up for this week's Right after the break, we'll be back with shark, well, she's a shark trainer and also an incredible marine biologist, Amanda Hodo. Stand by.
Amanda. Hi, I was definitely in the middle of a dance break, so. I know, right? That music was just so like, I know I was moving too. Um, okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do your intro. How did we do? Well, did you see the Jupiter versus Saturn would you rather poll? We did an audience poll during the break. Saturn won. Uh, I could only see about half of it. Oh, okay. Got you. Got you. Yes. Well, it turns out that Saturn won our audience poll. Would you rather visit Jupiter or Saturn? I think that's a mistake, people, because Saturn has those rocks flying around it. That's what makes those rings. They're just a bunch of rocks and stuff. And that seems dangerous to me, though Jupiter isn't much more um, hospitable. Anyway, back to Amanda Hodo. Amanda is an aquarium biologist at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. When she joined us on Mission Unstoppable, she showed us how she trains sharks. Today, she's showing us some of the new babies at the aquarium. This is so exciting. Babies! Yay. So show us what you have. Absolutely. So um, before I talked about training sharks, and I wanted to show you guys something that we read here that is connected with our shark exhibit. So first up, I'm going to show you a baby neon goby. And the goby is connected to the shark exhibit because we breed our gobies in-house. And then we release them into the shark exhibit where they actually will clean other fish. So they will eat the dead skin cells, the parasites, and leftover bits of food off of other fish in the wild. And in our exhibits, they'll eat those dead skin cells and extra bits of food. So I'm going to show you our baby. Gobies are so helpful. Right the desk. Yes. They really are. They do some really important work. <laughs> and this oh, is one of our baby gobies. That's our little tiny baby goby. It's so tiny. Uh -huh. Now, do, oh, so look tiny. at it. Swimming around. Now, do you... um? You raise the gobies not in the shark exhibit, but then you put them in it once they're once a little bit bigger, once they're a little bit bigger. Yep, so I'll wait until they're about adult size and then I will add them to the exhibit. That's so cool. How much bigger do they get than that? So they will get to be a couple of inches long. So this goby right here was born in July. So it's still uh, pretty young um, and I'll probably wait a handful more months before I add it to the shark exhibit. Can you pull the camera just back a little bit more? It's kind yeah. of out of focus. I just want to try and see if we can get it in focus Sorry, there. Everybody. That little guy. Oh my gosh, so cute. Yeah, and I feel like thing. people people buy those for fish tanks too, don't they? Yes, they do. So they're very popular um, in home aquariums and with, mm -hmm. with uh, aquarium hobbyists. Mm -hmm. And they're really, really important for healthy coral reefs. So um, we add them to our exhibits here to help improve the health of our uh, animals. And then um, we breed them so that we don't have to put pressure on wild populations. That's so nice. That's awesome. The, they're really, that's a really cute little baby. Um, cool, cool, cool. Well, I love that. And so I'm going to move yeah. over to the next one. Cool. So over here. I have a baby spider crab. So this is a short claw spider crab. And yes. this is a local species here in Sarasota. Mm -hmm. And um, this crab was born, well, it hatched in June. So it is five months June, old. July, August. They, man, they are really tiny, aren't they? Because spider crabs yeah. are huge, right? Uh, there are different species of spider Oh, that's crabs. a good shot from Ooh. above. Oh, yeah, that's good from above. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's great. So um, they will get to be relatively big, I would say, like, the size of your fist. Um, but there yeah. are different species, and uh, one of the largest species is the Japanese spider crab. So that is the, the largest species of spider crab. I feel like I saw one when I was like on a marine biology, um, oh, maybe it was called a sheep crab, but I mean, it just had really super long spindly legs and I must have thought it was a spider crab just because yeah. um, 
because of how long its legs were, but it was really deep off the, the West Coast here, off the continental shelf, okay. you know. Uh, my marine biology class went out there and we saw one of those crabs. Um, but yes, okay, so this gets about the size of your fist. So how long does it take to grow? You said this little teeny tiny thing is five months old? Yeah, it is. Um, so they grow kind of slowly. Uh, so I would say in order for this one to get to full adult side, it would be a couple of years. So they molt and when they molt, they're actually shedding their exoskeleton and um, they are growing. At, so yes. they grow, and they molt, and then they're like, they're new size, they're bigger. Um, and so I would say it would be a couple of years before this one reaches. Okay. Okay. Right so now, I grew they're young. They're molting like every two weeks. They molt every two weeks. And and I, um, growing up, I grew up here on the, the West Coast, and I remember on the beach there would always be like crab carapaces, which is just like that top portion of their body, right? Like the shell part. Right. And we would find them whole. Do they molt like their whole carapace at once? Or I always assumed that some seagull had gotten a they crab do. every time I found one of those. Oh, really? They do. So they'll typically... Basically, it'll look like there's another crab right next to them. So it's That's everything but but their eyes. You'll notice that, like, in a molt, their eyes yeah. won't be in there because they, right. their eyes stay the same. They keep their eyes. So, um, But yeah. it, it's like a, literally exactly the same as the crab except a little bit smaller. So um, it'll have all the legs and all of the abdomen pieces and all of that stuff. So. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, that makes me feel better because every time I saw one of those carapaces on the beach, I was always like, oh, some seagull got this poor crab. How sad, you know. But now now I know that it's just because they're molting. Um, yeah, and so well be molting. You said, okay, so this little, how, how big is that crab right now, this spider crab? Um, hmm, let's see if I can give you some frame of reference. So... This is my fingernail. Oh my gosh, here. it's tiny. So it <gasps> is smaller than my fingernail. Little baby. Did you did you name him? Yeah. What's his okay, name? Okay, I didn't, but I, I fight I fight the urge to name it every day. I promise. Um, <gasps> I have six of them right now, uh -huh. um, and I have them all in, and they I have them all in their own little um, little back bodies of water. I keep them all yeah. separate. Yeah. Um, and they're in varying sizes because um, some of them molt faster than others and stuff like that. Yes, so, yes. I, they definitely have distinct uh, looks to them, but I haven't named them yet. If any of our viewers have suggestions for what Amanda – oh, you need me to move on. Okay, just really quick. If any of our viewers have um, suggestions for naming the the crab, uh, write to us because because I, I definitely want to hear them. Um, awesome. Oh, great, great, great. And what is your next uh, next animal that you have to show us? All right. So the last one that I have to show you is a peppermint shrimp. And this one is going to be kind of hard to see because um, this peppermint shrimp is only a couple months old and is still like pretty much colorless except for a little bit of color on its tail and around its eyes. So it's a little blurry. Sorry, guys. Um, I but mean, it's it so is, tiny. It I can't small. believe it's two months old. I can yeah, see it's, its little. It's, I can see its little. What are the what are the. Mm -hmm. things called antenna. are they called antenna are they called antenna i wasn't sure if they were called antenna on a shrimp look at it. i can see it oh it's cute and these these shrimp are really cool because they do behavior similarly to the neon goby so they're a cleaner shrimp instead of a cleaner fish and they'll uh -huh. also eat dead skin cells and uh, little bits of food off of the fish in our other exhibits and their favorite one of their favorite foods is a pest anemone called apt aptasia and so that pest anemone can sting uh, our corals and sting other fish and stuff. So if you put peppermint shrimp in those exhibits, they'll eat the aptasia, and then your fish are healthier and um, more comfortable in their environment in that way, too. Oh, wow. Uh, peppermint shrimp are our friends. Look at that. I cannot believe that little teeny tiny thing is two months old. 
Um, that is so, so cute. Well, Amanda, will you keep us posted, please, on the progress of these babies? And, and also, I'm going to email you any names that come in from our viewers for your crabs. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. That is awesome. I, well, I think the viewers will do a better job naming them than I would. Anyway, I, we're so. going to come up with so many good names. Now you're going to have a hard time picking which ones you want. And we'll, we'll do a little, we'll do a little um, poll for that as well to pick the names. Love it. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. This is marine biologist Amanda Hodo. Um, what is your social media handle so everybody can follow you? Oh, yeah. So my Instagram is aquarium.biologist. So, Aquarium yeah. dot biologist. I love it. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Happy STEM Day. Thank you. Happy Bye. National STEM Day. Thanks for all your brilliance. See you next time. All right, everybody. Remember to do our poll during the break. Right after this, we have a Jacqueline Means, the STEM Queen. All right, see you soon. <laughs> Good to see you. Can I hear you? Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Yay. Okay. Let me do your introduction. Jacqueline Means, Jacqueline Means, the STEM queen, is a freshman at the University of Delaware studying neuroscience. I didn't know that was her major. I love it. She's the founder <laughs> of the Wilmington Urban STEM Initiative to empower girls in her community to be interested in STEM. Hi, Jacqueline. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. It's so good to see you. Um, everybody uh, in season two of Mission Unstoppable... Jackie is going to be in five episodes of it. Five episodes of it. I went back. I spent the whole day with her. We did so many great segments. You guys are going to love it. And I also found out that um, Jacqueline is very fond of mosh pits, which I know she hasn't <laughs> been able to get to one since the coronavirus. But I'm sure as soon as, you know, it's all over, you'll get right back to your punk rock dreams. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so we're going to do some experiments today, right? Yes. So our first one, we're going to be making a DIY lava lamp. So we're going Love to it. oil and some water. And that's just what we're starting with. Yeah. Okay, so, got it. I've got oil and I've got things with water in them. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. So if you just take, I think that container is good. So if you just take the oil and put like, a, estimate how much you think is about half of that, like half, the, that. half, <laughs> half oil in the water. So yeah, I get yeah, what you're so saying. Try to make it the oil and and the you're going to do it too, right? Parts. Okay. okay yeah, got so it. I've got a cup of oil in my bottle. Equal parts and then, oil and water. Got it. Yep. So I just did a cup of oil and then I've got my cup of water. In my oh, she, she already beakers. measured it. That's smart. You know why? Because she's a neuroscience major. Mm -hmm. She already <laughs> measured it. Mm -hmm. oh, gotta be prepared, you know? Yes. <laughs> awesome. I think I have Ooh, a few different bubbles. ones, too. Okay. Okay. 
looking good. Good. Okay. Thank you. So go ahead okay, and yes. even out all your water and oil. So okay, I'm gonna explain yeah. a little bit of what's happening right now. Yes, so I'm please. sure you and everyone watching can see that the oil and the water are not mixing. Now, why is that? You know, great question to ask. So this is due to density. Now density, the way I explain it to the kids that I teach is basically that one liquid is heavier, quote unquote, than the other liquid. So right. in this case, the water is heavier than the oil. So the oil is going to flow on top of it while the water stays at the bottom. But yeah, density, it's cool. And that so is actually, exactly what's happening. And you should absolutely explain everything to me just as you would the children that you work with. <laughs> Um, because as you know, I have a comedy and television background. Okay, so I've got my, and that is exactly what happened. I've got my, and isn't it weird that oil is heavier, is lighter than water? I mean, you would what think, you think like, it's heavier. Yeah, but it makes, but yeah. here it is, science. Okay, I know, got it's it. Crazy. <laughs> yes. So now, if you want, you can take some food dye and just put it in to the water. Okay. This is just an extra step, you know, because I like yeah, my yeah, science yeah. to be colorful. Yeah, and then I need purple, so I'm just gonna mix it in. The water is see. below. Hopefully, it'll get down to there. It's it okay. should sink. If it doesn't, it's okay. You know, it'll it'll still look cool. It will when yeah, we so put in the other stuff. Yeah. I'm gonna okay. pour my water into my bottle of oil, and it'll separate just like yours did. With the food coloring. Kiki's like, be aggressive with the food coloring, which I like literally just squirted it all over my lap, like even before she said that. <laughs> oh, that looks good. Like you got purple. Like okay, yeah. This one's gonna, this one is green, but I'm gonna put a little blue in it too to make it turquoise. Ooh, and then I love this turquoise. one had turquoise red. Is one of my favorite colors. Thank y'all. Awesome. And then this one had I red. I love that you have three. It makes it so colorful. It's just like, you know, you can it. look at any one of them. It's awesome. Seriously, let's see how it goes. I'm going to stir it with this pen. Get down there. Get down there. Okay. I like it. You got to attack it. Yeah. You got to you gotta be aggressive sometimes with science. You For know, sure. it's like, <laughs> gotta. All right. Here we go. Awesome. Okay. I think and I've now got the three This colors. is our catalyst, what's going to make it, you know, work and look cool. So okay. you can see in my mm -hmm. bottle and in all three of Miss Anna's that everything's separated. So we're going to take some Alka-Seltzer tablets. Yep. Yes. And then I've got mine right here. Them. Awesome. And just, you can break it in half or little pieces and just drop it in and then the reaction will stop. Or it'll okay. start. <laughs> it'll start. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Let me move this yeah, out of the if way. You look closely, you can see. Yes, I can the see it bubbling. Yes, yeah. I love it. All right, here we go. Get in there, Alka Seltzer. Oh, geez, oil. There's oil everywhere. Yeah, it's a messy experiment, but science is messy and fun. That's what makes Yay. it awesome. Yay! This is so fun. But yeah, this is the DIY lava lamp. Literally, anyone could do this. You just need a water bottle, some water, oil. Food diet if you want to, and an alka seltzer tablet. It's so easy. Yay! Here it goes. Can you see it on the camera, Alina? I'm like, can you see I it? I can see your bubbles from here. I see the red Yay. ones really well. Good, good, good. But yeah, that is our DIY lava lamp. So now, what happens? The the alka seltzer makes the is going to make the water lighter and rise to the top here. Yeah, that's basically it. So the alka seltzer provides. Um, I think carbon dioxide underneath. I don't know what yes. I said, I think. I know. You know. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so it provides carbon dioxide to the water and that makes it, you know, bubble up and rise to the top. And once it loses all of that, it falls back down to the bottom and, you know, just reuptakes it all the way. Yeah. Yes. This one's starting to go good. See? See how the, the Alka Seltzer. Awesome. Oh, the yeah. Alka Seltzer just floating to the top. Get back down there. Oh, no. <laughs> Get back down there. Time is up already? Mm -hmm. This is too fast. I only get 10 minutes with each person. I wanted to ask you how school's going. I wanted to ask how it's going. I, and I wanted to ask how you came upon neuroscience and if you were considering <laughs> anything else. I mean, you're like the most interesting person in the world. And now we have to go. Uh, this is terrible. Well, you're going to have to come back anyway because we're sure. going to be doing because you're going to be in the show like five times this season. And so you will definitely come back and I'll be able to ask you all of the dream questions that I want. Yes. All right. Next time we can do an even cooler experiment. 
Yes, absolutely. I'm just gonna oh throw these in here just to get a little more oh bubbles going. <laughs> and then I'll see you later. Awesome, Bye, Jackie. Oh wait, you. tell us, tell us where tell us your social media handles. Tell us your social oh. media handles. You can find me everywhere at STEM, S-T-E-M, Queen, Q-U-E-E-N. And yeah, that's it. STEM Queen D E because I am from Delaware. So STEM Queen D E. STEM Queen D E. Follow her on social media. She's fantastic and one of my besties. All right. <laughs> see you next time, Jackie. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Um, right after this, we've got Kristen Lear and Bats. Kristen Lear loves bats. Kristen Lear loves bats. Should I just do this for 10 minutes? Definitely. Happy STEM Day! Look at my song. <laughs> Yay! This is Kristen Lear. We're both wearing our STEM Day tiaras. Kristen yeah. Lear, so good to see you. Oh. I actually filmed and directed your segment that we did in Mission Unstoppable Season 1 where we actually caught a bat and measured it and made sure it was healthy, and it was. Um, okay, let me do your introduction. Kristen Lear is a bat conservationist. I almost kept, I kept saying conservate, conversationalist in the, in the, <laughs> in the rehearsal, and I'm like, she is a bat conversationalist as well. Anyway, Kristen Lear is a bat conservationist in Fort Collins, Colorado. She found her passion for bats in sixth grade when she built bat houses for a Girl Scout project. Since then, she's dedicated to, uh, dedicated to protecting bats in the U.S., Australia, and Mexico, and I would imagine worldwide, really. Anywhere you'll get the chance, you will protect a bat. Um, Kristen, what do you have for us today? You're going to show us some stuff. I right? have, yes, I have some really cool bat stuff. I'm actually going to talk about how we catch bats and how we study bats because it's, you know, I guess get asked a lot, like, what do you do as a bat conservationist? Yeah. So I am going to do a little demo. I have my little demo bat here. We can see. It, it's fake. It's not real. Don't worry. Yeah. But I got my little <laughs> bat. So, yeah, I'm going to go through and show what we use to catch bats. And we actually, if you watch the episode, um, you'll see these uh, in, in the show. Yeah. So we use what is called a mist net. So yes. it's basically this gigantic net that's like 30 feet long and like 20 feet tall and it's kind of like a hair net you can see it's really fine filaments and i'm getting myself stuck in my crown <laughs> um yeah, and the fun thing about these nets is that because the filaments are so fine when it's stretched all out it's really hard for the bat to see it in time while it's flying and mm -hmm. before it gets caught um all bats have eyes all bats can see so you know that blind as a bat saying is a, a total myth all bats can see but I you know they're flying know really fast. until this moment that the blind as a bat thing yeah. was not real that is crazy it is not real and people think because they're out at night you know and so they're I out always the thought it's because so they used fly. echolocation everybody thought yeah. yeah but but they can also so see yeah and the some net is also too thin the, 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 it's also too thin for echolocation to pick it up as well, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's like really fine. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Okay. So yeah, so they're kind of like flying along, yeah. you know, hunting their insects or whatever they're hunting and they get caught in the net and then 
we get to take it out. So <laughs> yes. what we do, yeah, this was uh, the fun part of the segment. Yeah. We always wear gloves. We put our gloves yes. on because for two reasons, you know, we if bats are afraid, just like a cat or a dog, they can try to bite you. They're yeah. small. But we still don't want to get, you know, get bitten. And then also we want to protect the bats from anything that we might have or other mm -hmm. bats might have. So we change sure. these nitrile gloves between each bat. And then we take, we go up to the net and we take the bat out of the net very carefully. Yes. And we are trained so we know how to, to do this and we hold them without hurting them. Mm -hmm. So here we are. We kind of have the bat in our hands. I love it how I just got cold. concerned when you were like, I am holding it without hurting it. I was like, that's right. She's <laughs> not going to hurt. It's a stuffed animal, but I'm still just like, mm -hmm. I won't hurt hold it. Don't it worry, delicately. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But no, you do. You don't want to like hurt them. You know, yeah. hold them gently. Um, and then we need to figure out like what species, what type of bat it is, um, mm -hmm. try to figure out age and how healthy it is. So we take a bunch of measurements. Um, so one of the things that we do is we weigh it. So mm -hmm. just like we, when, we, when we go to the doctors, you know, we take our, get our weight taken. So I'm going to put this bat in a little bag. Mm -hmm. This is not the type of bag we would use, but it's what I had here at home. Um, so, yeah, we'll take that in the bag. And we have this cool little scale. It's a hanging scale um, yeah. that you just put the bag on. And we've weighed the bag so we know how much that weighs. Um, and then we measure. We just hold it. And then we read the measurement of how much it weighs. And this bat's like 48 grams. So that's a pretty big, healthy, healthy bat. <laughs> That's bigger than most bats we have here in the U.S. Um, so that's good. That's what we like to see. We like a big fat bat. We do like a big fat bat. That makes, <laughs> means they're healthy. Yeah. And then we get to uh, measure the wing. So we want to measure the forearm length. So they have the same bones that we do in our arms. So we want to measure how long that is because that will help us figure out what species it is. So I have these really cool calipers it's like a very yeah. fancy ruler and you can like slide it up and down yeah. and we basically slide it all the way out to measure that forearm length yeah. and this is about nine centimeters so that's again mm -hmm. a really big bat which is good. show them on the show um, them on the screen where it shows on the caliper that it's nine centimeters just so people can see yeah she removed that little rule and then it marks it right there exactly perfect that. that's so cool yeah, that's so cool mark. yep because otherwise you'd just then, be holding yeah, we, the thing while it's moving around and trying to get your ruler marked. And, exactly. Yeah, so that's really cool. And some bats are really calm and some bats are not calm. So it's always yeah. like hit or miss with what you get. Yeah, they got I don't different know if you personalities. Caught, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> the bat that we caught was mad yeah. at you. Ooh. It was not happy. Well, I wouldn't be either if you get like It was healthy, bed. though, too, which is also, you know, mm -hmm. it was really healthy. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I was glad. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, we that's what we do, and then we figure out if we can figure out like if it's an adult or a juvenile by its bones. We look at its uh, mm -hmm. basically its finger bones with a light, and we can mm -hmm. see if it's an adult or a juvenile. Mm -hmm. uh, we figure out if it's male or female, um, and then identify the species, and that's pretty much it. And then we, the best part is we take put it on our your hand, and when it's ready, yeah. ooh, off it goes. It flies, and flies away. Out. So that's, that's, it. Yeah. that's so fun. awesome. Well, it is always a joy to see you. And this is our STEM day. So we're just doing these 10 minute little sets. But I will see you again soon yeah. because I know you're going to be on one of our episodes coming up and we will do a much more lengthy conversation. But thank you so much for joining us awesome. today on thank STEM you. day. Yay. Yep. And tell yeah, us about, I am on social um, media too. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I know you've tell been asking that question. <laughs> yes, I totally have. Um, I heard you join TikTok. I, am, um, I did. Oh my god, I did join TikTok. It, I feel like it. So dumb doing it, but it's fun. Like it's really fun. You know. Every, no, it's um, the best. Yeah, we need to do a yeah, bat. It dance. really is. We're gonna do a bat dance for it. We should do a bat dance. Mm -hmm. We can do bat hands. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm on uh, bats for life underscore. Kristen, um, Got and that's it. on Instagram, and then Bats for Life on Twitter. So Bats, yeah, for, definitely. Fine. Bats, the number four life. That's Kristen Lear. 
Is that it's right? F O R, not F O R. So bats, F O R, life. Spelled out exactly like that. Bats for life. Kristen Lear, bat conservationist. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you, you at like in a week, I think, or two, something like that. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Bye, guys. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> All right, right after this, everybody, stay tuned for another DIY with neuroscientist Latasia Jones. I saw you was at the if then summit and I remember I had cut your segment together and I was kind of like fangirling you and I was like kind of following you around a little bit and then I was like oh hi sorry I'm Anna Winger I'm the showrunner of Mission Unstoppable I know you because I've watched your segment like a million times but you don't know me and I remember that was when it was so nice to meet you in person so yeah, it's good so to well, see you again yes okay so this is like super quick these 10 minutes and I go on and on so like we're doing an experiment with you right if you want to, if not, I can go through it with you, go through it fast, and you all just watch at home. Let's let's do it. I'll, I'll do it with you. I'll do okay. it with you. Let's do it. Okay, okay. So this is the elephant toothpaste experiment. So yes, I am a neuroscientist by background, but I really love out of everything that I've ever done was experiments and just seeing what happens when you combine things and change parameters and so on. So. With the elephant toothpaste experiment, you can find everything at your home. Hence me being in the kitchen, I have a show called Kitchen Science on YouTube where I'm showing you how to explore science from your home. So all we need for Yes, the hold on. Is Actually, a- will you go back to that slide because I skipped it and I wanted to mention this. I usually do an intro, but I got so excited to see I fangirled again on you. And I wanted to say this. <laughs> Latasia Jones is a no neuroscientist problem. in Washington, D.C. She spends her days conducting medical research and spends her nights teaching children about STEM on her Hey Dr. Tay YouTube channel. And I wanted to mention that. Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, Hey Dr. Tay YouTube no, channel. No I'm problem. very excited about that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. So for this, to make elephant's toothpaste, all you'll need is a clear container. Inside, I already have my hydrogen peroxide, which is just a normal hydrogen peroxide that's over the counter. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you're gonna wanna first pour in hydrogen peroxide into your clear container, and it really depends on how big your container is. I have this amount, but usually I still make a mess regardless. It's gonna foam over, so just make sure you're protected. Yep, And then I'm gonna do it in this tub. um, then you're going to want to add some dish detergent. And I only do a, about a tablespoon when I'm really yep. measuring, but you know, sometimes you don't measure. <laughs> right, right, right. And the point of the soap is to allow the energy that's going to happen in your reaction to release itself in the form of bubbles. Okay. You caught up with me? Okay. Almost. I'm putting food coloring in it, though. All right, perfect. So the next step is food coloring. Oh, sorry. And it's just as many as you want to give off a co- whatever color you want to give off. My I did this is really dark, so I only did about four drops. Tablespoon. And last but not least, if you, if you already have your yeast, you're going to want to mix it in warm water. And only warm water because yeast is a living organism. So heat that is like extreme will kill the yeast. That's very important to understand. Ah, when we add it. yeast to the experiment, it's going okay. to speed up the reaction. So okay. what we're going to see is Hold the bubble over effect. What's, what's going on on your side over there? 
Oh, I, no one knows what's going on over here, Latasia. I put an undisclosed <laughs> amount of uh, dish soap in here. No one's really sure, but I think it might be a tablespoon. Um, is it? Should I put more just in case, or what it do you think? Should be okay. If you put should, be okay. Tablespoon, should be okay. Okay, I've got hot. I've got warm water. I've got yeast. I'm pouring the yeast together. in the warm water. I'm mixing it up with my pen, which I've been using right. for everything. Whatever you have, we're improvising. Hey, whatever you got around, right? <laughs> Smells like bread. <laughs> yes. So you're doing something right. I'm doing something right. <laughs> All right. And once you have it mixed, go ahead and add it to your okay. hydrogen peroxide. Okay, and you're doing it too, too, right? Awesome. Yep, I'm adding it now. All right, here we go. So as you can see, it's rising. Yep. This is energy being given off in the form of the bubbles. And this is why it's called elephant toothpaste because it looks like toothpaste being squeezed outside of the tube, right? Ah, it's working! <laughs> I did it! <laughs> so, <what> Yay! <laughs> so a lot of people always ask what's the more extreme version of this and why didn't it like give off extreme heat yeah you can feel a little bit of heat coming off of it but just for oh a you quick can demo, feel heat just right you can right yeah for a quick demo and i always do this with the kids and it's not safe to do at home because this is 30 percent hydrogen peroxide and Ooh, this is the real science look at that she put on goggles she put on gloves goggles and gloves i do not play with my life and my beauty so <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add the potassium permanganate and watch what happens. Okay. Oh! Whoa, and that's so cool. Actual heat coming. You, you see the heat coming off the experiment. This is what makes it an exothermic experiment. That means the heat was released after we combined the hydrogen peroxide and the potassium permanganate. Same thing that happened here. We, did, we just didn't see as much heat because it's less concentrated and because we use bubbles. So everybody usually likes this one a lot better. I wanted to make sure I provided that as a demo. So oh, no. I love them both. I love the way that yours is cascading down, kind of like in these groups. And then the heat right. from the exothermic <laughs> reaction there. And look at this. I mean, mine is just like it was hardly any stuff. And it's just filled this whole thing with, uh, right. you know, elephant toothpaste. And it is warm. And no one has ever <laughs> told me that before. That's the exothermic reaction happening. Yeah, it is. It oh my is. gosh, I love that so much. <laughs> science. This is how you got into science, just doing experiments. Actually, yes. My, my first research experiment was with microscopic worms. And you couldn't tell me anything after that. I had to be a scientist. <laughs> I had never seen a microscopic worm in my life until then. And it was the most when exciting thing ever. That is so cool. And uh, you're a neuroscientist studying the corpus callosum. Are you still studying the corpus callosum? So I'm actually, I actually left out of the lab. I mean, you uh -huh. know, you're going to be a scientist by heart for the rest of your life. But That's yes, right. when, I was studying, when I was studying the corpus callosum, I was studying it to understand a little bit more about autism spectrum disorders and to mm -hmm. hopefully help out kids and understand the abnormalities in the brain that's occurring in autistic children. That is so cool. Uh, well, I always love seeing you. And I know that you're going to be on another I episode love. of Science and Stuff soon, right? Um, this is a, we're doing Absolutely. short. Yay, I'm so excited. We're doing short things today because it's STEM Day. So we've got. Yay. Yay, STEM Day. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. And um, and let us know, tell, tell everybody again about your social media handle and your show on YouTube. Absolutely. So I have a website as well as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. All of them are, my name is Hey Dr. Tay. That's H-E-Y-D-R-T-A-Y. Sometimes with the period, sometimes not. Um, and I also have, that was everything. Yeah, that's everything. So Hey Dr. I Tay. I love it. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and we'll see you soon. Bye, Dr. Latasia Jones. See you soon. Okay, everybody, um, right after this, we are going to have Fossils with Miria Perez.
experience an earthquake than a hurricane? How's it going? I can't hear you. Say say it's something. Cool. Oh, I hear oh, you. Oh, happy STEM day. Can happy you hear STEM. Me? Yes, I can hear you. And happy STEM day to you too. Um, we have this online poll and we ask people if they would rather experience a hurricane or an earthquake and the audience came back with earthquake, right? Earthquake? Yeah. Earthquake. Y you feel that way too. It's hurricane. I'm from oh, Houston, so I've already done the hurricane stuff. Oh, see, I've done the earthquake thing because I'm from California, so that's why I want to experience a hurricane. I mean, look, nobody really wants to experience a hurricane, but if you had to do one, you know, do the one you haven't done before. Um, ooh, let me do your intro because you're very important and cool. Miria Perez is a fossil preparator at the... Perot Museum of Natural Science in Dallas, Texas, meaning she releases dinosaur bones and other fossils from rock. That's so exciting. And it's every kid's dream job. Talking real dinosaur bones here. The fossils she works with haven't seen the light of day in 68 to 70 million years. And I think you have some to show us today, right? I have a couple fossils to show you, of course. Yay, cool. So I'm going to start out with most people's favorite. I have a T-Rex tooth here to show you. No way. It's huge. Yeah. And it's even bigger. So this is what we call a shed tooth. So meaning it's what the animal released after another tooth was growing in. You can see right here kind of this little indent, indent right here where yeah. another tooth was growing in. And Whoa. so the root would have been this big, like banana sized. And they have 50 to 60 of these teeth in their jaws. That is crazy. <laughs> now, how old is that, is that fossil? So this fossil is what we call a cast. And uh -huh. because fossils can be um, very rare sometimes, mm -hmm. we make copy. Yeah. And so this is a um, high quality copy or cast um, of the T-Rex fossil. So real T-Rex is so about cool. five years old. Yeah, it's awesome. That's so cool. And, um, okay, what else you got? Sure. And then I have um, another large animal called a Megalodon. It is the largest shark to ever exist. And so the this Meg, is a real... Like that, that movie, which I know isn't like real or anything, but that's what that movie is called, right? The Meg, like Megalodon? The Meg. The megalodon, meaning big tooth, meg, big, dog tooth. Oh, I love it. And so, yeah, this is a megalodon tooth, and it's serrated just like your kitchen butter knife. And also T-Rex had a serrated edge as well. And so that's to help eat their food. And I Is that I to help when they're chewing or when they're ripping off? It can depend. And for T-Rex, you'd think, so with T-Rex, you'd think that it would be really sharp, right? Since it's a carnivore. Yeah. Well, it's actually not that sharp. It's pretty blunt, even though it does have mm. that serrated edge. Mm. It was made from mostly crushing bones. So it had to be really strong mm. and thick so it could crush bone like Triceratops. Whoa. So that T-Rex <laughs> teeth are made to crush bone. I did yes. not know that. And um, were those, was that megalodon, where was the megalodon tooth found and where was the T-Rex tooth found? So this megalodon tooth was actually given to me as a gift when I was a kid because I've been obsessed Aww. with fossils since Aww. two years old. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, I don't know the location, but you can find megalodon teeth in Florida and, you know, and, and all over the place. So megalodon yeah. is pretty All common. over the U.S., though? All over the U.S.? Um, I know Florida for sure, and yeah. the Carolinas have some, but got I'm it. not sure about every one. But got it, got it. Just curious, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. And then the T-Rex tooth, I actually got at the gift shop at the Pro Museum. They sell <laughs> these cats, so I, I had to get one that. <laughs> and but and T-Rex are there? There, those fossils are found in the U.S. though, right? Yes, they're yeah. found in the Badlands in Montana. And they are pretty incredible animals. Also in Texas, too. You can find them yeah. in Big Bend National Park. 
That's so cool. I love it. That I love to just imagine Tyrannosaurus Rex running all over Texas and, you know, megalodons in Florida and the Carolinas. It's just so cool. Very cool. A fun fact about them is they actually didn't live at the same time. Um, megalodon came along way after the dinosaurs mm. had died out, mm. so about mm. 20 million years ago. And they got ate it, whales, which is another cool thing about them. They ate <laughs> whales? How do you know they ate whales? There are whale bones, believe it or not, with megalodon teeth stuck inside the bone. Oh, my God. That is so exciting. That would be so exciting to find, wouldn't it? Ugh. Yes. That's really cool. And so my job, I get to unearth these fossils, and we're working on a dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus, which is yeah. a relative of the Triceratops. And so yeah. we're working every day to um, break away those fossil or break away those rocks from the fossil using cool tools like air scribes, which sound like a dentist drill. Yeah. So you just plug in your earphones or your headphones, and you just go to go to work, and it's very therapeutic. <sighs> That must be so fun. And the Pachyrhinosaurus, it's um, an herbivore. You kind of compared yeah. it to a Triceratops? Got it. And where is that? Where, is, where did the Pachyrhinosaurus live? Sure. They were from northern Alaska. All the way up, if you know where the Brooks Range is. Mm -hmm. They lived there during the Cretaceous period about 72 million years ago. That is so <laughs> fun. Uh, and how far along are you um, in unearthing the Pachyrhinosaurus fossil? So we have multiple what we call jackets or projects. Yeah. Um, and the bones are just jumbled up in there. So we have these really big cases. Think of plaster. So it's kind of when you break a bone and you get a cast, you know, that like white plaster that hardens. We do that, but over the fossils, we bring them back and they're huge. You know, they take up a whole table. Um, so we have, or we have four of them right now that we're working on and they take months to, you know, even a year or so uh, mm -hmm. to uncover depending on what's inside. Mm. But we're slowly moving away. And when you're looking under the magnifying glass, it looks like you're making a huge progress, which you are. And then, you know, you get up and you look yeah. at it out in the magnifying glass and you're like, oh, that's just like two inches of work. <laughs> That's awesome, though. That's so cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I, we're doing this short schedule today because it's National STEM Day. But I know they're going to be on the show again soon. And will you tell our audience where we can find you on social media, please? Yes, I have an Instagram, and it's called Paleontologica. If you can't find that, you can search my name. I think I'm like maybe the only Miria out there, or there's actually a few, but you'll find me, trust me. Yeah. And then on Twitter, I'm Perez underscore Miria. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you for sure again soon. Everybody, that's Miria Perez. Bye. Bye. I'll Bye bye. All right. Next up, um, we are going to check out our immune systems with Danielle Chum coming up right now. <laughs>
trying to vote for burritos real quick. Oh, we're back on. Hey, everybody. Next up is Danielle Chum. Danielle Chum is a cancer immunologist in the San Francisco Bay Area. When she's not trying to find a cure for cancer, she uses her platform to encourage women in STEM. Uh, today, Danielle is going to teach us about our immune systems. Hey, Danielle. Hi. Happy STEM day. I don't think I've ever talked to you in, like face-to-face. Even though I've seen your segment like so many times that I know you and I've emailed you a bunch of times, we've talked on the phone, but it's great to see you in person. Likewise, it's so nice to see you in person after all the emails. I know, seriously. We just did a um, a uh, would you rather poll, would you rather eat tacos or burritos? And, and the answer is burritos, according to our audience. And I feel the same way, but it's like, I don't want tacos to know that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Well, is it like an open burrito or is it a I mean, closed it's burrito? a closed burrito. I, you know, it's got to be a closed bowl. burrito. I love a burrito bowl. Really. A burrito yeah, bowl. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, what what can we say? But anyway, oh my gosh. Well, um, I just loved your segment about what you were doing with um, – with uh, to cure cancer using the magnetism separating the cells which is so 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 cool um uh, but today you're going to talk to us about our immune system right correct yes i will great yeah i think we have a slideshow presentation that we're going to put up too exciting (laughs) here it is Uh Awesome, even better. Um, so yeah, I'm sure the immune system is in everybody's mind right now, especially with the pandemic. I mean, everybody's talking about COVID. And um, one thing that we all should recognize is that our immune system every day is protecting us. Um, but we only recognize that something is wrong with the immune system when we get sick. So <laughs> we should always be mindful. Right. That our immune system is always putting in work. Um, so we should not, you know, be mad at it when we get sick from the flu or something like that. But today I'm just going to be talking about my three favorite cells in the immune system, which I think are the backbone of the immune system. Um, if you could advance to the next slide. Yes. So I, mean, I think everyone knows bacteria and viruses definitely make us sick across the board. We have flu season coming up. We have the pandemic uh, that is ongoing, unfortunately. And, you know, mm-hmm. you have tummy aches, you have headaches, you always wonder, um, these, you have bacteria and viruses and many other, we call them pathogens, that actually cause illnesses. Next slide, please. Um, but how does your immune system fight back against these pathogens, which are disease-causing organisms? And mind you, they're really, really tiny. You can't see them with your naked eye. You need a microscope um, to be able to see them. And so the next slide, I believe, introduces um, B cells, which... Uh, I like to call them buddies because they have this, um, they have, a, I call, I think they have a bow and arrow because they produce these things called antibodies, which can be likened to arrows because what antibodies do is that they actually coat, if there is, if this is a, a bacteria, a virus, or a pathogen, antibodies can actually coat the outside of the pathogen and actually lead to its death, killing it, um, which I think is wow. really, really cool. And yes. your are actually responsible for memory. So if you meet an, a pathogen um, that makes you sick, your B cells, after they kill them, they retain a little bit of information about this pathogen. Mm-hmm. So that next time it you it again, it can quickly choose the correct type of arrows and actually neutralize it, which I think is really, really neat. That's so cool. I love that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. B cells are really cool. <laughs> And then you have these uh, cells called macrophages. And their name literally, as it says in the slide, translates into big eater, macro, Mm -hmm. big, age, Mm -hmm. eater. And how do you think macrophages, they kill pathogens? They literally eat them. They eat them (laughs) up, yes. And I remember you talking about macrophages in your segment as well with cancer cells. They they are able to eat cancer cells as well sometimes. Yes, they are. Um, So the thing Mm -hmm. about macrophages, I think one thing we should all know is that our cells and our bodies have unique tags. I like to think of it, you know, when you buy a shirt, you always have that tag that says like 30% cotton, 40% polyester, you know, those Mm -hmm. things. Yeah. All cells in our bodies have tags. 
that say, okay, these cells belong to Anna, these cells belong to Danielle. Mm -hmm. um, when you're sick, your cells that are infected actually start showing a different kind of tag. So let's say you go from 30% cotton to 50% cotton. And it's like your immune cells are able to look at those tags and say, ooh, something's not right over here. Let's mm -hmm. do something about it. And that's how macrophages can see that a cell is infected and, and actually go ahead and eat it and destroy mm -hmm. it. They don't just walk around eating every cell. That would be yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They have to know what right. to eat. Yes. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Cool, cool, cool. And then uh, lastly, these uh, T cells, uh, which have been, if you've been reading the news about the pandemic, we mm -hmm. are all um, know that viruses, uh, they love attacking um, our cells. And T cells are one of our premium ways of um, fighting viruses because T cells are um, actually able to produce, I call them hole punchers, um, mm. which are called perforins, which their name literally suggests perforant to perforate something. And yeah. what they can do is they can talk to a cell and find out that, oh, this cell does not is not actually functioning properly. And how about we get rid of it? And they get rid of it by punching holes in the yes. uh, infected cells. So got it. Yeah. Got got it. So if anyone ever asks you how does your immune system fight off infections, just always say your immune system can eat the infected cells. It can shoot arrows or antibodies at them, or it can poke holes, <laughs> and then you're fine. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, I love it. Yeah, and the arrows they actually they cover the receptors, right, of the <laughs> of the of the virus cell or the uh, pathogen cell. That is so cool. Yes. And are you still working um, uh, in in cancer research, or have you moved on to something else now? Um, yeah, so I actually I, I don't work in a lab anymore. Uh, so mm -hmm. if anyone is out there and wants to think about becoming a scientist, you can be a scientist outside of the lab, which is actually really neat. That's right. I work. <laughs> I, I had work to punctuate that. Doctor. Listen to Danielle Choom. She's really cool. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I work in a cancer diagnostics um, company. Yeah, which means that if uh, if somebody has cancer, unfortunately, we're able to use next generation sequencing, genetic sequencing. Mm. Remember when I was telling you about how clothes have tags? Yeah, and it can tell you. Yeah, cancer cells also have tags, and with those tags, you can determine whether somebody will do better with one drug or the other. And that's what yeah. I do right now. Danielle, we are so lucky to have you working in science. Thank you, Thank you so much. And um, tell us where we can find you on social media. Absolutely. Um, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Forged Onyx, F-O-R-G-E-D-O-N-Y-X. Yeah. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn at Danielle Chum. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have a cancer question or if you need any clarification. I'd be, yeah. I'd be glad. Yeah, I remember when I started following you on on uh, social, and I was like, "Forged Onyx, so tough." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's so good. I love it. I'll never forget it. I love it. Well, thank, thank you. you, thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Thank Bye, Danielle. You. Happy National Bye. STEM Day. You too. Okay. <laughs> right after this, we have big giant arachnids and bugs with Lauren Esposito. See you in a minute.
Lauren Esposito. I'm so excited to see you in person. I'm Anna. I watched, um, I've watched your segment a million times, so I feel like I know you even though we've never met. So, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, and let me do your introduction because you're very cool. Everybody needs to know everything about you. Lauren, uh oh, I lost picture here. Um, Lauren Esposito is a rarity among us. She actually loves spiders and scorpions. I actually know a lot of people who love spiders and scorpions. Um, all that, all things that bite, sting, and that I force myself to not be afraid of on a daily basis. I always have to tell myself, Lauren, which I'm sure you tell people all the time, like, it's just a spider. You don't have to be scared of it. But to be fair, I do catch and release spiders. I never kill spiders. I catch them and I put them outside because that's where they belong. Um, uh, let's see. So you're going to show us some of your awesome specimens at the California Academy uh, for Sciences in San Francisco. And we've been following this murder hornet story very closely. But well, anyway. what I was saying is that I have giant hornets. I mean, you have some people giant call them murder hornets. hornets. The news likes to call them murder hornets, but they're really giant hornets because uh, they're not out to murder you. They're not out to murder us. I know. That's unfair. And I know that they're calling them murder hornets because are they truly a threat to... We all know how, how the news likes to blow things up for, for effect. Um, uh, are the Do they really murder honeybees, though? Because they, I read that that's why they say they call them murder hornets. Yeah. Well, like, like basically almost all wasp species, they have um, periods of their, of their life, well, actually a large yeah. part of their life where they're predatory. So they're like predators and all yeah. wasps are predators. Uh, yeah. And these murder, these murder hornets or giant hornets, mm -hmm. as we've known them for the last hundred yeah. or 200 years in, in the world of entomology are the largest species of hornet. Uh, mm. And they, they're, they're big. I mean, they're genuinely like really big hornets. I mean, they're very yeah. big wasps. Like, they're Whoa! startling. Whoa! Uh, Whoa! And, Those they, are they, huge. And they do murder honeybees. Like, they're predators, so they'll eat yeah. honeybees. Um, that's that's Well, they got to eat something. I mean, that's science. And, you know, I think it's they interesting that you. Baby. I Exactly. And I think it's interesting that you said that, Lauren, because you've known about, and entomologists have known about these giant hornets for over for 200 mm -hmm. years. But to yeah. us, it, we all thought it was some new species of like, this is some new freaky hornet. And you're like, nope, just big hornets, guys. They uh, happen to be in the U.S., though. Yeah, I see. Can you show yeah. them again just to everybody? Yeah, sure. And, and they were um, they were first uh, documented scientifically in, in the mid-1800s. So we've actually known about them for quite a while. Wow. And they're, yeah. they're big. They are big. Man. Like, they're quite, like perspectives everything but this is my finger like those are big those are big yeah, hornets those i was a big hornet terrified if one stung me although yeah if it did sting you you like the the effects are probably not much different from the average wasp for the average person of course like always right. there's concerns especially for like the elderly or people mm. that are allergic to wasps um or very yeah. young children people with compromised immune systems but for the average person you're probably going to be just fine uh and again yeah. like the 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 introduction was really limited. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and and uh, state parks uh, are all over it, um, and yeah. they're really tracking this. Like they're putting tiny little like radio trackers, trackers. on the individual hornets to like follow them back to their yeah. nest so that they can find if there's any nests. And and so I, I don't think that there's much for anybody to be concerned about. Yeah. The outbreak is still really, really localized. Yeah, yeah. No, I heard that. And we heard about the scientists in uh, Oregon who were able to track down the murder hornets. And, you know, I was thinking yeah. it was I was kind of laughing because they were like, oh, if you see one, like, tell us which way it went. And I'm like, you want me to tell you which way a bug went? Like, but when you <laughs> look at a giant hornet, you're like, OK, it's a significant large thing. You know what I mean? Like, you could be like, yeah. it went that way. And somebody could conceivably just see it, you know. But um but yeah, that's but those really are like, cool. These are like hummingbird size. Like you probably would yeah. see it. No, you, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like now that I see it, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. You know, um, like driving next to it on the freeway and look out your window and. <laughs> Yeah, giant totally. hornets it's just like right next to you that's so funny they're really beautiful though the colors on them yeah. and, and everything yeah they're it's a lovely beautiful. palette lovely color palette yeah um actually if you have can you... get like a good macro photo and see their eyes like it looks almost like the universe is like swirling around oh in, their, in the lenses of their eyes they're pretty beautiful uh, like you like just disappear into the giant hornet's <laughs> eyes um so you said you've never been stung by a giant hornet have you been stung by a scorpion 
I have been stung by exactly one scorpion in my yeah. like almost 20 years of being a professional scorpion biologist. Yeah. And yeah. it was like two years ago and I was yeah. passing it from one kindergartner to another and it like got grumpy after having been held by like 60 kindergartners. Right. It was like, okay, that's it. And it well, it, know, I like and... it that it stung you because it was like, you're yeah. the one putting me in these children's hands. Like, I'm not going to sting yeah. one of these kids, but like, I know who's doing this. <laughs> that's so funny. I really do think that Scorpion probably knew. Um, and um, did you have more things that you wanted to show us? today sure i mean i have tons of stuff so like i'm happy to show you as long as you want to keep looking yes yeah show me some more stuff We're, we we okay. love it sure so i mean speaking of scorpions i have a scorpion right here <gasps> uh, little so, baby yeah, look at that beauty. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a this is the largest species of scorpion in the world the the african emperor scorpion um, and nice. these are the these are the species that you like see often in the movies, or if you've ever seen a scorpion for a sale in your local pet store, it was probably this species. Um, really, it's, a, it's huge. Like they have these huge meaty claws. Mm -hmm. uh, they look almost like lobster claws. Yeah, Actually, they my, do. Actually, my grandson thinks that this is a lobster whenever I show it to him. Um, <laughs> I don't. No he's matter like, how many she's times got I that lobster not. out again. <laughs> yeah. He's like, give me that lobster. I love lobster. Um, <laughs> and, and they use, like, these these guys are pretty cool because they, they actually almost never sting. And that's why they're really common in the pet stores because they just use their claws for pinching and they don't really ever right. need to use their venom. Or they've, they've got so much strength in those little meaty claws. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and awesome. they are also the only species that is currently listed on the CITES Red List, which is the, the, the list of animals on the planet that are endangered. Uh, and Aww. that's because they've been over harvested in their native environment for the pet trade, for the pet store. Really? See, don't buy yeah. scorpions, or at least just not that well, one. Well, right? make sure that they're captive bred if you're going to buy one. And, and, make and sure they're also captive bred. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. it's an investment. They live How long do they years? live? <gasps> they live 25 years? Wow. Yeah. So it's like big, a bigger investment than getting a puppy. Uh, makes yeah, make sure you're planning to take care of that scorpion its whole life. And what do they eat? They eat like pretty much anything they can overpower, but like the easiest things to feed them in captivity are things like crickets or commercially available roaches. Um, yeah. And in the wild, they'll, similarly, anything they can overpower, which is mostly things that yeah. are like around at night, like crickets, moths, yeah. uh, all Smaller. those kind of like nighttime bugs. Yeah, smaller bugs. Got it, got it. Yeah. That is so cool. Well, this is, we're doing short segments today on, on because it's STEM Ooh. day, and I could talk to you for just a little, I want you to go back and do every single one of those posters that behind that's behind you. I'm like totally <laughs> checking them out. I love them. I just want to know everything, but we'll, you're going to come back again and join us for a longer segment another day. Awesome. But um. Thank you, thank you so much. And let us know, uh, do you, can we follow you on social media? Do you have a social media? You can, yeah. You can follow me on Twitter at Arachnology Nerd uh, yes. or on Instagram at Cass, so that's C-A-S underscore Arachnerds. Love it. Uh, C-A-S underscore Arachnerds, and then it's Arachnerd on Twitter. Arachnology Nerd on, trigger, on Twitter. Just making it making sure we're right arachnology nerd on twitter awesome thank you so yeah. much lauren thank you. i can't <laughs> wait to see you again talk to you bye. later bye. bye she's she's awesome dude the, I, seriously i could look at those i could look at that stuff all day um okay right after this we have chemistry a chemistry diy another diy i hope i do it right with uh helen tran see you in a minute
Tran, how are you? It's good to see you. Happy National STEM Day. Hi, Anna. Happy National STEM Day. Yay. Um, we're going to do, oh, let me do your introduction because you're very cool. Helen Tran is a, molecular is a molecular architect and found her career through her love of science and art. On Mission Unstoppable, Helen taught us about polymers through boba, and today we're back in the kitchen with soda cans. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening. I've got a, I've got a, a um, what's this called? A hot plate in front of me. I've got mm -hmm. a soda can, and I've got mm -hmm. a thing of icy water. So yeah, today I want to show you guys a demo on a gas loss, right? So we think about gas in our air, and we also have gas. Uh, we can make steam to fill up the volume. So here I have a glass heater. I'm going to heat it up. And when I heat it up, I'm going to, uh, this hot water will turn into steam. So you see all that steam coming through? Yes. Right? Usually, yes. This steam will fill up the container of this last bottle here, right? Okay. Then I'm gonna put a balloon on top. Okay. And so we see that there's air here, so the balloon isn't inflated and it's on the outside. Uh -huh. As this container cools down, you'll see that this balloon goes inside the bottle. And that's because all the steam, I kind of like to think of them as these really active molecules. They're running around when they're hot. And then as yeah. soon as they cool down, um, they sort of settle in, they condense and back into water. And so the pressure reduces. So now the pressure out here is higher than inside the bottle. So the balloon right. sucks in. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put this here for you guys to see because it takes cool. a while for, to sort of happen. For the air, for the steam inside to cool off enough so that it gets, so that it reduces in size. Okay. Got you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. You can even see the balloons already, you know, it feels like it's sucked, yeah. sucked in. Oh, there it goes. There so it we'll goes. There and let it cool down. And then, you know, this is a slow process. So let's do something faster. So that's okay, the demo cool. you can do. Okay. So this is heating first, up. Yeah. This is heating up. So maybe I can do it first and then you can give it a go. Okay, that's good because I, I have no idea. So yes, please <laughs> you do it and then I'll try it. Okay. So I have a can here. It's empty. Uh -huh. I'll add a little bit of water, mm -hmm. right? Maybe around a tablespoon or two. And then I'm going to put it on the hot plate here. So okay. if you were at home, you could do this straight on the Bunsen burner or uh, uh, your oven uh, stove top. Uh, right. I'm not at home right now, so I don't have a kitchen, so I have a hot plate. Right, um, right. A little bit of time for this hot plate to heat. And I will know that I'm making steam when I start seeing a little bit of sort of white uh, steam okay. coming out from the top. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. You can hear it, right? And so maybe you can, right. you turn on the hot plate, maybe you can I also- I turned it on. Up. Here, I'll put my, I'll put my, I've got a can here and I've got okay. two tablespoons of hot water in it. I got, okay. got my tongs. Got your and tongs, I'm okay. Gonna, I'm gonna put this right here, ooh. It's already sizzling. Okay, so let's see how long this takes. Should I step, okay, we'll, stand back? We'll start seeing some steam coming up in okay. a very quick while. Um, okay. And then what we're going to be doing is I'm going to take the can with my tongs because the can is really hot, so I want to make sure it's safe. Yes. And I'm going to dump it upside down into this cold ice bath. Okay. And so when I do that, I have all this hot steam inside the can, just yep. like this glass bottle. Yep. But in this glass bottle where I have the balloon kind of deflating to sort of equalize the pressure, I'm gonna seal that in the can. And what happens is the pressure outside is a lot more than inside. So it actually will crush the can. So it's very exciting if you've never done it. Have you done it before, Anna? No, I've never even heard of this. And and I literally didn't even know you were going to do this until today. And they were like, so all <laughs> you have to do is take the tongs, lift up the burning can, and put it in. And I was like, what? Are you ready to go? I'm going to flip it. I'm going to flip it. Well, let's, mine, is yours steaming up yet? Or nope. Is yours steaming up? I don't see any steam yet. Mine is almost there maybe it will it's take a getting little bit there time. though 
boil up the water. The, we want to make sure that the water is boiling. Right. And that means the can is Let me cool. know if you can see steam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we want to make sure that the can's hot and it's full of steam. So as soon as I we put it, it, I put it water. on a little bit after yours. So yours might go before uh -huh. mine. But that's okay because yeah. I wouldn't mind watching you do it. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a pretty loud noise, so it's pretty okay. exciting. When you okay. I'm excited. So I think maybe I should have painted it a little earlier, but uh, it's part of the excitement. <laughs> no, that's okay. This is part of science, right? You gotta wait. You gotta be yeah, patient. Yeah, you can see the balloon. Oh, look at your balloon. Too. Yes. Starting to go in. Um, that's I a great. That's a great experiment. I've never seen that one either with the balloon on the on that. That's that's really cool. Yeah. I'm going to pour some cool water so it'll help it cool down. Oh, that's it's smart. This See, is such scientist. a large. See? <laughs> smart. Molecular architect. Oh, you can see as I'm pouring it, it's cooling it down. The balloon's actually moving down. Yeah, there. totally. There. Oh, oh, it popped down. <laughs> I love that. That is so cool. I'm going to do that. We're going to do that on the show. That's a good experiment. Yeah, that's pretty fun, too. All right. So I think my can is almost I'm excited boiling. to see this. I'm listening to see if I can hear it boil. I hear just the... This is a brand new um, thing, so it's like, I'm new, <laughs> click, 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 but I don't think it's boiling yet. Usually I put a little bit less water, so boil faster. Yeah. So maybe I got too excited, I put a little bit too much water. I know, I got excited too, and I put in too much water, because when I picked it up, I was like, this is hardly any water in it, it doesn't even have water. <laughs> and I was afraid it would boil too quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mine is almost there. I'm, I've I'm never seen this experiment it. either. Yeah, this is pretty safe. You can do it at home. You know, mm -hmm. you have some cans of seltzer or soda, and your oven or your stove top. There's some ice yeah. water. Um, so this is going to cool down so quickly that the is it steaming? Lexi sees steam. Oh, there is steam. There's a little bit of steam. Should I go? Do you want me to go? You can go first if you have more. I, I think. So what you want to do is grab the tong, uh, grab the can with your tongs, and flip uh -huh. it upside down. All right. In the, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do it, and if it doesn't work, we'll just do it again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm like, we'll just do it again, right? I don't. I saw so, steam for a second, and now I don't see anymore. I think mine is boiling, so I can I can go first, and then see. Okay. Go yours. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I can. Right now, I don't know if you can hear it, but it's like boiling on my side, sort of like okay. when you boil the metal. Okay. So I'll yeah. take this. Let's sit down. Oh! So the pressure difference from the outside to that steam was so strong, it collapsed the can. So it's kind of cool. Oh, it's definitely, mine is definitely steaming now. That's so cool. Okay, that is so okay, cool. All right, I'm going to be just like... Brilliant molecular architect Helen Tran. I'm just going to turn this right upside down in here. Ready? Oh! oh! <laughs> well, you know, yeah. not everybody can be just like brilliant molecular architect Helen Tran. It did collapse, it did collapse. a little it bit, did. it filled with water. Mm -hmm. I think my so water was, wasn't cold enough anymore, maybe. It could also be my hot plate really hot. It's been sitting here for a while. Let's do it again. Mm -hmm. Do it again? again? All right. I mean, I want to do it again. Do we have enough you time? No. Can we? We don't have enough time. No. They won't let me do it again. Uh, well, yours well, worked at least. It did work. Maybe try shooting it longer next time. To and be maybe, fair, we just got this 10 minutes before yeah, we started. Yeah, um, I've, I've been preheating <laughs> mine for a while. <laughs> we did not practice, um, but this is really cool. It did crush, it though. You see, it did crush. It, it did it collapse did crush. somewhat, you see. 
But it just didn't make as, as exciting of a, no, a noise as yours did. But I'm going to do this again. Do it again. We'll do it. She said, uh, Elena, my producer said we could do it at the, again at the end of the show. So this is okay. awesome. Helen Tran, I love this experiment. Thank you so much for joining us and teaching us new things. You're an inspiration as always. And tell us where we can find you on social media. I am on Twitter. I am at Helen underscore Chem, C-H-E-M. Got it. Helen at Helen underscore Chem. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see you very soon. And I'm going to do this Bye. again right away. Bye. All right, everybody. Right after our next Would You Rather, we have astrophysicist Erin McDonald. We're talking Star Trek with her. I am going to. Can we do this in the break? Can we do this again during the break? It, it should heat up very quickly. Okay, great. I'll turn off the blazing hot thing that's on my oh, be careful you you can leave it there you can leave it there don't don't try and grab it yeah yeah yeah. we'll just let it cool down we'll just let it cool down I'm so fired up about this experiment that Helen Tran just showed me I'm just dying to do it again but I will wait until the end of the show yay Erin McDonald yay it's so good to see you Erin McDonald is an astrophysicist who works as a consultant for film and television currently she's consulting for Star Trek Discovery on CBS right yes it is so good to see you, though, Erin. It's great to see you, too. Thanks for having yes. me. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for being here. And um, you have one of the coolest jobs ever. You're an astrophysicist who is a consultant for film and TV, which, I mean, could it, could there be a better job? Um, and you are currently working on Star Trek. Is that a planet necklace? Like It th is. <laughs> I mean, that is fantastic. I need one of those. That I'm is repping beautiful. all the space science. I mean, right you're now, like so. all the space science. <laughs> um, Aaron, it, you are a warp drive expert, and you're going to teach us all about warp drive right now. I'm gonna try. <laughs> I love it. Tell Excellent. Us what's up. And in, I mean, just to atone for my technical difficulties, I'll try to make this as quick as possible. But no, no worries. don't worry about it. Don't worry about all it. Right. It's not your fault. <laughs> Sounds good. It's not your fault. Um, yeah. So it's this idea of our universe being basically a fabric. And uh, we think of our universe as a fabric of space time. So that's three dimensional space, one dimension in time. And yeah. when we have mass, like a bowling, like, well, a bowling ball, a planet or a star, we can treat them like a bowling ball on a trampoline. So I have sort of a fabric <laughs> i love it i don't get to do hands-on demonstrations that much no i love it science, so. yes this is <laughs> and awesome. then we're going to take my handy dandy spaceship and i'll just show you how when you introduce this in our universe it dips down right it's okay can you down. hold it just a little tiny bit higher because we've got you yes, in this I cool can. thing so we can see your name but it it <laughs> does mess up the, the okay. framing a little bit no worries at all. So when we introduce Okay, so we've our... got the spaceship on your space con fabric. Got it? Yep. And so that mass is going to dip it down a little bit. And that's what limits us being able to move fast in space. Um, when you have a lot of mass, when you're really heavy, 
you're dipping space time a lot and it's hard to move through that. And the less mass you have, the lighter you are. And so you're not dipping space time as much. And then when you have no mass, you just coast along on a straight line at a fixed speed, which is the speed mm -hmm. of light because light doesn't have any mass. And so this is why space is very, <laughs> Space is very big, just to establish that. The yeah. closest star system to ours is over four light years away, which means it'll take light traveling at its maximum speed because it has no mass. It'll take yeah. it over four years to get there. So if we want to do fun, fast, action-packed science fiction, yeah, we really want to be able to go faster than that. Right. And science fiction has come up with some great, great ways of doing this, but representing Star Trek, um, mm -hmm. we'll talk about warp drive because I think that's what most people uh, think of. So we're going to talk about this idea of our fabric of space time that our ship is in and it can't really go any, you know, it can't move much faster yeah. than that. But the laws of physics don't say that space time itself can't move faster than the speed of light. So the Got idea it. of a warp bubble is that you essentially wrap your ship up in the fabric yeah. of yeah. space time and then that itself moves faster than the speed of light. That bubble will just carry your ship. The whole fabric faster. moves faster. Moves. Got it. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Ah. And um, mathematically, this is actually entirely possible. Like I said, it doesn't violate any laws of physics. The issue is, is that if you have mass, um, you uh, you dip space time. But if you want to dip space time and you don't have mass, like if you want to warp space time around your ship, that's going to require a lot of energy. Because another thing that Einstein came up with was E equals MC squared. That's energy equals mm -hmm. mass times the speed of light squared. And so if you don't have mass, you could use an equivalent amount of energy, but it's a lot. And it's right, way right. more than we have access to right now. So that's right. what's going to like prevent us from developing warp drive but mathematically it is possible <laughs> that's amazing now i absolutely never knew that mathematically even warp drive was possible i just thought it was made up now i have a question did they know when they made up warp drive that it was also mathematically possible or did they make it up and then people such as yourselves came in and figured out a way that it could be possible. More the latter, I would yes, say. Yes, <laughs> I like it. I like that's it. That's the great part about this, though. I mean, that's why entertainment and representation is so important, because it yeah. inspires scientists to then go, oh, hang on. How like, could we I, do that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's so. what science is, right? Imagining something that's isn't possible currently and then figuring out how to make it possible yeah exactly uh, sometimes segment, through math sometimes through labs but yeah this, it's fun yes yes this whole segment is just a beautiful metaphor for what science technologists engineers and mathematicians do every day thank you so much for joining us Always a pleasure. And I know you're going to be back on the show again soon where I can talk to you for longer. Thank you for wearing your STEM day tiara, which I have on too. <laughs> um, awesome. Awesome. And tell everybody your um, social media handles. Yeah, it's uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Erin Mack, D-R-E-R-I-N-M-A-C. And that's also my handle here on Twitch. So um, you can just look up Dr. Erin Mack on Twitch and I stream sci-fi and science and yes. uh geek out about science fiction on my Twitter account. So I feel love free it. to check it out. <laughs> Can't wait to check it out. Thank you so much, Dr. Aaron McDonald. See you again soon. Bye. Bye. Awesome, awesome. Right after this, we are learning about soil with Dr. Yamina Pressler. She knows soil secrets. It's STEM day.
it's so good to see you. Yeah, um, it's been a while. I know. This is so exciting. I loved your segment so much. I watched it like a hundred times. But you and I also met, I can't remember where, at the If Then Summit, I believe. Yes. Yes. yes and I was like, she Texas. has to be on the show. Oh, so it's so up. fun. And I love yeah. this crown. I got it in the mail. And I was Thank like, you. oh, I'm so excited I about this. too. And I really like the way my hair looks. And I was like, how do I do this, like, not wearing this crown? <laughs> like, when it's not STEM day, you know? Yeah, it's, um, it's great. Yay! Well, thank you for wearing it and joining in the spirit. Um, let yeah. me do your intro so everybody knows who you are. Dr. Yamina Pressler likes to get her hands dirty with soil, that is. Yamina is a soil scientist at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. She finds millions of microscopic organisms in soil, including the internet sensation, the water bear. Look at that little guy. So famous. I love it. Love Everybody's it. so obsessed with water bears. Can I ask you a question? Do they have like organs like a regular animal? Yeah, they are an animal. Yeah. So, so they are this microscopic animal that lives in soils, mostly in the watery part of soils. And yes. you can often find them like swimming around mosses. And I always imagine these little tardigrades. And actually, I've seen them, you know, floating around. And yes. sometimes you can find them eating a little piece of moss and yeah they're like little they're tiny so animals cute they're i adorable. love them <laughs> oh my gosh that is so cool that's so cool um and what else were you going to tell us about today you're going to tell us of different things about soil what you got what you got yeah so i actually brought a little bit of soil in this cool. jar here i put it in this fun little square jar so nice. this is actually some of the soil that was in the segment. I'm trying to show you well with the lighting here. And yeah. one of the yeah. reasons I wanted to show you this today is because we often think about soil as just kind of this brown stuff that's out there in the world where plants yeah. grow in. But soils are actually incredibly diverse. And yeah. they're all kinds of colors and textures and they're super diverse uh, all across the world. And so this soil actually has a really dark layer at the top and then a lighter layer down below. And like before I studied soil science, I had no idea soils were different colors. We, yeah, there's me neither. Colors, red, all of the colors. It's like a rainbow underground. I didn't I had know no until idea. you showed me that soil book that you have with all of the different colors yeah. of soil in it. And I'm like, there's blue soil. And you were like, yeah. Yes. Blue soil. <laughs> blue yeah. Away. And it's one of those things like soil is everywhere around us, right? And so it's mm -hmm. easy to kind of forget about it and, and sort of overlook it. But as soon as we have the eyes to be able to see it, then it's everywhere. And it's like this little underground adventure that's just waiting to be discovered. That's so awesome. And what are you studying today? Or what are you studying these days in particular? Yeah, so one of the reasons I also wanted to bring you this soil, if I open up this jar here. Oh, yeah, show us what you got. Show us what you got. So there's actually a spider. Oh, it just jumped out onto my desk. Perfect. Ah. Uh, I know we had an arachnologist on here earlier. <laughs> but like, even if you look at this piece of soil, soils are full of life. Can you see this yeah. root here? Yeah. Have to hold, it like that? hold it. Hold it like a little bit more to your right. A little Ooh. bit more to your right. Like maybe, yeah, in front of the, like that? that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see can it Can you there. see that little plant root? Yes. Yeah. So that's just one example of some of the organisms that it. live within the soil. I love how I'm like this, like looking at the Plants, <laughs> of course, root within the soil, right? Yeah. But there's all kinds of other microscopic organisms that live within these what we call aggregates. So these are clumps of soil that create yeah. little habitats for organisms. So things like the tardigrades, but also bacteria and fungi and plant yeah. roots. Yeah. And all of these microscopic organisms. And so that's what I study for, for my work as a soil scientist is I'm really interested in the millions and billions of different little microscopic organisms that live within the soil, what they do, how they interact and eat each other, and what that means for how the soil develops and how it functions over space and over time. Yes, that is so cool. I love it. That is awesome, awesome. And what other uh, microscopic animals do you find in the soil? Ooh, well, there's all kinds of things. One that I haven't set, said yet are the protozoa. So there's lots of different protozoa. Some have little flagellates that are kind of like tails that help them swim around the soil. Yeah. But one of the things, Anna, that I think is so cool about the soil organisms that I've been thinking a lot lately because I've become a birder, 
I don't know if you know this, I've started looking at birds. I have is that a chart of all of the birds in North, Amer um, North America on the wall of my hallway that I consult on a regular basis. So, so when, we, we, when we think about soil organisms, we're often thinking about microscopic organisms, right? Like, yeah. you know, little bacteria and fungi. But actually, there's all kinds of different organisms, everything up to larger organisms like birds and voles. So like a burrowing owl, for example, they make nests within soil or even larger animals like a little fox for example might burrow down yes, into the soil that's right. and so they soils inter soil. yeah they intersect with all kinds of different organisms not just the plants that grow there but also the microorganisms that live within the soil the little tardigrades and larger organisms too and so it's really this super diverse habitat for everything uh, on earth soils are really the basis of all ecosystems like they're the basis of life as we know it so it's well, really yeah, fun to study them yeah and we needed it to grow our food you know yeah in order to survive yes absolutely uh, i love it yeah, so that's a, much that's a big part of it too i mean i think soils are of course super important for growing food and for our agriculture but they also provide all kinds of different things to society as well like they filter fresh water for example they play an important role in regulating our climate. They maintain all of this biodiversity, both below ground in the soil and above ground as well. And so there's all of these things that soils are doing in the background that we often forget about because we're not actively looking for them. And so one of the things that I want people to see is how dynamic hold and exciting- Hold it up again, hold it up again to the camera, the, the jar. Yes, yes, the yes, look at that. Look at that beautiful yes, soil. <laughs> what's, the, what's the lighter part below and the darker part above? So the darker part is the surface. And the reason that it's so much darker is because it has a lot of organic matter. And there's a lot of clays that are very sticky that hold on to that organic matter. And it gives it this beautiful dark color. Yeah. I love yeah. it. And this is freshly collected. I actually collected this for all of you today. Just Thank today. Thank you. So Fresh soil. She loves smelling it. You see good. how she likes smelling it? She loves it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't help myself. I just, and I'm actually going to keep this in my office here yeah. at home. I'm in my home office and um, yeah. at work, I have a lot of different, you know, soil and rocks and things. But now that I am spending more time in my home office, I'm like, I'm going to keep this as decoration, as a yes. memory from the day. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's really great. It's really great. And well, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, you. I was just gonna say that. What's the the lighter part? Doesn't the lighter part doesn't have the organic material, which is why. Yeah, it's so I assume there's a little I bit of organic know. matter there, but the reason it's white is because there's a lot of calcium carbonate in it, and that comes through the process of soil formation. So as that soil is forming, that calcium carbonate accumulates, but it also comes from the rock from which the soil forms. So soils will weather or sort of uh, become. Yeah, they form from the breakdown of rock, right? And yeah, so yeah. a lot of that leads to the different colors in the soil. Got so it. there's lots of different types of rocks, and therefore there's lots of different types of soil. And it leads to this beautiful diversity on the yes. skin of the earth that oh. is just great. Soil, it's the skin <laughs> of the earth. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Yamina Pressler. You heard it here on Science Yay! and Stuff. There is blue soil. Always a pleasure to see you. And I know we're going to have a longer segment with you very soon, right? On Science and Stuff. So I'll see you soon. Yes. Bye. Okay, great. Thank Good you to so see you much. Everybody. Happy Bye. Sunday. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before you leave, don't go. I was supposed to ask you about um, your Instagram handle. Your Instagram oh, handle. Oh, yes. Yes. So you can... Follow me on Twitter at Yamina Pressler. It's just my full Perfect. name. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Wonder of Soil. And that's mostly where I share my art because I make art of soil as well. So if you want to check that out on Instagram, I'm on there as well. You have to see this stuff. Dr. Yamina Pressler, you will not be disappointed. Thank you so much. All right. See you again soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> She's so cool. Um, right after this, my science makeover with Lydia Morales. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. We'll be right back. Yay! Oh, I hit the wall. <laughs>
We'll figure it out. Hi, Lydia. It's so good to see Hi. you. Yes, I've got you. all this. Yeah, oh my gosh, thank you so much for being here. Um, Lydia Morales is a special makeup effects artist in Los Angeles. She is an yes. expert in special makeup effects, also in beauty and character makeup. I mean, all makeup. You're an expert. <laughs> um, ooh, there's coffee ooh. grounds here. I'm really excited to see yeah. what's going to happen, which I have no idea. Um, yeah. And you're also a fantasy and sci-fi movie fanatic. And today... Yeah. We're going to transform me into a mad scientist or a scientist look. Mad scientist? Yes. Scientist? Um, Which is awesome. They're all a little awesome. mad, aren't we all? <laughs> I mean, we are. Yes, absolutely. Um, so this is awesome. Well, I've got a bunch of stuff in front of me. So all right. walk me through. Do you have your uh, goggles? We're going to start with yes. giving a little bit of an outline for where yes. your goggles be. Okay, got it. Oh, so you're going to walk me through this. You're not going to do it yourself. Yep. We're going to see if I can communicate the ways and send you the vibes to get this right. Lydia, am I wrong or are these the coolest goggles you've ever seen in your entire life? Oh, absolutely. The steampunk <laughs> madness. I love it. They totally <laughs> are, right? Yes. Awesome. Okay, cool. Okay, so I got my okay. goggles. So if you have a black eyeliner, a brown eyeliner pencil, one of these, we are is. going to just roughly trace the outline got of it, your eye. It. I can't believe I'm doing this right now. I'm just like, You're a mad scientist. So something I, must I'm mad and I don't have a, I literally, <laughs> uh-oh, I lost picture. Um, and I don't have a mirror, really. I've got this little mirror. Okay, let's try this. This will be fun. You know what? This is gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. This is super. And you fun. know what the best part about this is yes. you're a mad scientist. So if you mess up and make a mistake, it's I mean, not, it's not yeah. gonna matter. <laughs> it's not gonna be like now she doesn't look mad anymore because that line isn't straight. Oops, oops, I broke it. Too aggressive. Okay. Too aggressive Just with too my funny. eyeliner. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, so yeah. I've got my outline here. I love it. I think it's complete. Okay, you can go ahead and shed those. Steam I will off. never take these steam <laughs> goggles off. Yeah, no, I, I can have them back later. Oh, yes. look at this. Oh, that's, that's oh this is perfect. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Okay, okay so step. now you've got some eyeshadow, right? Yes. In different shades. Yep. So the goggle outline that you just made is as if an experiment went wrong and it's in your face, right? So oh now you're going to start packing on a little bit of eyeliner sloppily. You don't have to do it in strokes or whatever. Around, around the outline. outline. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're going to so blend the outline out. I'm going to blend the outline with, by the way, Lydia, I'm terrible at putting on makeup. <laughs> I never put no. on makeup. I Not never true. put it on, but I I love putting it on. Okay, I'm just kind of thickening this up with black eyeshadow. Is that what I should be doing? You can do that, yeah. And then you can take another brush where you laid it and kind uh, of dab and flick up upward and uh, out. Okay, got so it. you're kind of creating this ashy, chalky, you know. Look at this. Yeah, Look there that. we go. There we go. Sorry, I'm starting to up and I see I'm the ash. It. <laughs> So proud yeah, of myself. Yeah, and if you want to just dab it in a couple places, you can blend it out and rub it around and down and just oh, use whatever. Oh, you mean like dab brush. like chunks, like, yeah. like that kind of. So we're like, I see. Bring it around, blending it out. Okay. You can go in with browns, or if you have some, <laughs> like, you go on with whatever you want to do. Get crazy. <gasps> Okay, but you want to keep it on the outside of this outline here because I have to be like the goggles blocked it from getting in there. See, I started to get in there a little bit there. Okay, exactly. So, so brand. And you can use your fingers. You can get in there. Okay. Mush it around, whatever right, you feel. Because right. because your right. your hands are going to be dirty if you touch anywhere else. You're going to have yeah. fingerprints. All of that yeah. works if you like using brushes Got or it. sponges or fingers. Got it. Got it. Okay, so let's just make this look crazy. I got to blend more. That's what you're saying. Yeah, you gotta blend go. more. Blend. There we go. Okay, got to blend. Up and around. Up and around. <laughs> 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 I 
Do we have any makeup remover here? <laughs> we forgot makeup remover and a mirror, just so you know. So Well, that just means it's going to have to be your night look. You know? We're killing it. Oh, I'm going to out <laughs> after this. Yeah, I'm just going to be wearing weird. a mask, and then this will be my eye. You know, like, if I were to go anywhere. Um, I mean, okay. that's all you really need for this costume. This what did you say? Look. This is all you really need for the makeup right. look is a little bit of ash and dirtiness. Right. So now... You said you had some coffee grounds in the beginning of this, yes. correct? Do you also have some eye uh, mascara lash glue? Uh, uh, yes. I bet that's what this is. <laughs> that Duo. is what the whole thing is. Duo yes. strip lash adhesive. Okay, and coffee yeah. grounds. So for anyone who likes lip lash, it's so easy. All you need to do is take a Q-tip with a little yeah. eyelash glue, kind of Put it wherever you want to put the coffee grounds. The coffee grounds are going to look like dirt. They're going to look like ash, soil, just like from the last segment. We want to get you all muddied up so you can kind of do the same thing and blend okay, it. and do it um, here, too. Like, around. Yeah, wherever okay. you think. Okay. Wherever. Coffee grounds. Yeah. You heard it here on Science and Stuff. Oh, I'm yeah, putting my hair in my face, too. So Whenever I'm on set and we have to do scabs or anything like that, coffee yeah. grounds with some fake blood and, you know, glue like this is really easy. See, it's like a five minute you're only going to hear this. You're only going to hear this yeah. from geniuses like Lydia Morales. <laughs> Another great know. option is also erasers. You can just use a cheese grater and shred up some of your yummy eraser, and they come in yellow and pink and gray, and there you go, that's dirt, and you can add that to your scab for some texture or your face. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah, you see now you got that grit in there. I mean, if nothing <laughs> else, the comedy. Uh, I mean, my <laughs> producers are cracking up. So that's good. I mean, the it really looks good. good. It excited. works. It works. The hair these are just, I mean, I use these all the time for character applications. You know, pirates, they need dirtying up on the beach, yeah. you know. Yeah, pirates are filthy. It's great. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you mind though? Because I now I'm covered in glue and coffee grounds. Uh, shit, Kiki like doesn't want to be on camera. See, this is this is yeah, just like that. That's great. <laughs> just because I had to go like this in order to get. I'm just sprinkling it's a, it's a coffee, coffee facial. grounds on my cheeks. Like this. I mean, it yeah. smells great. Thank you. It Kiki. does. It's an added uh, effect there. <laughs> yes, so crazy with it. <laughs> You're already looking like a mad scientist. And honestly, whatever else you have left on your hands, just kind of yeah, dirty up whatever the party is. Oh, yeah, it should be everywhere. Party. Here, I'll put it down here, yeah. too. Yeah. You've got pit. You've got, you know, yeah, need you continuity it throughout the whole yeah. look. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You're like, we need continuity throughout the whole oh, look. <laughs> I love it. Coffee grounds. It does look yeah. just like dirt. And it's like it the does. perfect, co oh my gosh, I'm just literally patting glue into my face right now. I, I, Guys, it's all safe. This glue goes on your eyes, you know, like. That's right. It goes gonna on be your great. eyes. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Okay. I, I yes, would just I'm go in and go like this a little bit. Make sure you. That harsh line, I would blend it out a oh, little bit. Oh, blend it. You got to blend yeah, it. With okay, your got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too harsh. I get you. I'm looking in the. I here. Let me try. Again. <laughs> I'm using the TV. As, you know what I mean? Like the screen. Yeah, it's. I see what you're saying. You got to. There we go. And now some of those patches yeah. are going to start lifting, so you can see some skin through. So it's going to start to blend a little bit. You're going to get uh, that muddy texture. Oh, look at that. Oh, you're yeah. a genius. Oh, my gosh. Look at how much glue is on my head. And don't worry. It's not going to pull your skin too hard or anything like that. You don't have to go too hard where there's extra glue. But it's all okay. safe and gentle and can pull be removed easy. Too remover. hard. Getting aggressive with the glue. <laughs> now I'm just covered in coffee grounds. <laughs> how are you feeling? Amazing. I smell really good. <laughs> like coffee, which is the most important know, right? thing. Yes. So, I think a scientist would also have a little bit of a burn of some sort, right? Spotty. Yes. I feel like I'm a little <laughs> bit spotty. I, I, like, glanced at a picture that they showed me, and 
I feel like it wasn't, at, like, I have a lot of spots here, but I feel like it was a little bit more, like, kind of stripey, too. Yeah. When in doubt, I just put more on everything. Like, <laughs> when I cook, I'm just like, you know what this needs? More sugar. I'm always like, sugar, <laughs> butter, all wow. the things. Okay. Okay, got it. Yes. And so, yes, we talked about uh, having a burn, perhaps. We did. And this is something that you can use as a prosthetic. You can also make it at home. It's called gelatin. And jello is a common household item. So yeah. I think you have some pre-mixed gelatin. It's super easy to make. I, um, am, I am supposed to have some pre-mixed gelatin. I heard them just run into the kitchen and <laughs> put it in the microwave right now. Well, it's a really easy thing. Um, oh, yeah. Tell us how it's done. A lot of these are used in um, scars, gashes, cuts, smaller types of applications that you can put kind of anywhere. Um, the edges are easily blendable with witch hazel, which is also like a common, you know, thing for skincare, which is great. Yeah. And you don't even need it necessarily. Um, yeah. And the way we're gonna be applying it is warm. So just so make sure it's not too hot. this is the gelatin here, okay. Yeah, so it's already like flesh toned. So I would just tap it with your yeah. finger on the edge to make sure that it's, fine. you know, like a baby bottle. Yeah, so then you can go ahead and take that nice soupy gelatin and yeah. start applying it. You know, if you want to do your arm, your neck, wherever you'd like the burn to be, but you're just gonna kind of yeah, okay, cloth right. sure, sure, and down. This actually feels kind of good. And plop and down, plop and down, and pull down. Look at that. Is it getting on there? I can't see it. There we go. Let me see. I have another mirror here. Oh, God. That actually looks great. Yeah. So you're just going to kind of that. cut it up like little bridges. Because when you when you have a third degree burn, a chemical burn, it's going to eat away those few top layers of your skin. But it's not going to do it evenly. Um, right, right. If the gelatin is getting too sticky, you can always pop it back in the microwave for okay, five give it seconds. another, give it another thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll be quicker this time. I'll be boil. quicker. Right. For you those who want to do it at home, yeah, you can just create the gelatin mixture. Um, uh -huh. It's really easy. As you put uh -huh. it in the microwave, you just put it yeah. in for five to ten second intervals, and you mix it. And as soon as it's melted, that's it. If it okay. boils, you're going to know because it's going to smell bad. <laughs> don't, and then we don't boil it. Only do it for five to ten seconds. She heard yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it'll smell bad if you boil it. Um, um, yeah, so you can use molds and stuff, but you can apply it straight to the skin. So yeah. with third degree burns, it unevenly gets down to the layers. So by creating a bridge texture, meaning by applying it here, bridging it over to another spot, and just kind of doing that back and forth, you're going to create holes. I see. That will show depth, and the gelatin's already flesh toned. So oftentimes, you don't need to do much in terms of additional fixing to match skin tone and anything that drips it's going to be really easy to take off you can actually Got kind of like roll it off your skin when this is all done yeah yeah the um i can't tell if my hair is in it or not i got too much hair <laughs> this is awesome actually yeah and and you can see as it starts to dry yeah it'll get trickier so you'll be able to kind of manipulate it a little bit and then you can build it up too. It dries very quickly. Um, it will be sticky though. So you don't want to go in and touch it with your other hand or your other right. fingers because it will fine. let it dry now, I think. Yeah. Right? It shouldn't take that long to dry. Okay. Maybe I'll do a little bit more in another spot just because I'm learning. Yeah, so this is super I'm just putting jello on my neck, coffee on my face. I mean, this yeah. Is fun because this is stuff it's people can play with you. at home. Yeah, and this is super easy for, you know, at home Halloween sort of thing, which is what this is tailored to. What, if you're going to a party, you don't know what to right. do, this is a super easy thing to achieve. Um, yeah. So it'll be good. Yeah. Sorry, and Elena then, wants to get in there. Elena wants to get in there and get this neck, <laughs> neck burn situation that I'm doing. This is a true camera woman you here. You can see the floppiness of the skin there, yeah. How it's yeah. torn up. Yeah. Say it again, Lydia. It's going to be, you have the skin and nice little bridges. I can see how it's like yeah. torn up a little bit, which is great. Yeah. 
And then when it dries, we're going yeah. to put translucent powder on it. Not too, too much. Just kind of dip your brush. Yeah. Tap off the excess. Okay, got it. Dab it on. That way it'll get totally rid of it. Oh, no, wait. I think it's... Hey, the translucent powder is still in the other room. Yeah, got it. Okay, got it. So you, you yeah. put the gelatin. I just plopped it on there, and I kind of, like, dabbed it and then made, like, a little bridge. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to put some translucent powder on it. That's going to blend it into the skin. Yeah, it'll make it a little bit lighter. It'll also take away all that stickiness. So once you're done, you're mm -hmm. going to be able to go in and add a little eyeshadow color if that's what you have at oh, home. I mean, cool. We're kind of trying to do it with whatever, whatever everyone might would have around. Yeah, so I you just can feel go like I need more of this all yep. over my face because it felt like <laughs> this too. It wasn't too everywhere clean. enough. Yeah, it was too clean. It wasn't right. Okay, here you go. Oh, and this is a little bit sparkly. So clearly this scientist got involved with some sparkly experiments. Alchemist, you know, you never know. Yes. Um, okay, <laughs> great. Okay, cool. Um, and now I've got translucent powder here. And I need, I have a brush here. Okay, got it. So now I'm going to put this on top of the gelatin. Mm-hmm. You can just kind of pat it on top. You don't want to wipe because it'll, it's still sticky. So you just want to kind of pat it with the brush until it's yep. all kind of covered. Yep. And then when it's all covered, you can brush off the excess. And that'll enable you to like move your neck around and it's not going to feel weird. It's not going to feel sticky. So I don't have to sit here like this anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, this is so interesting. I want to do one of these on my face, too. They're fun. You do a lot yeah. with gelatin. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so now that it's on there, um, off my, okay, yeah. And then, um, and then let me do, um, the, so now that the, um, I'm starting to get coffee grounds <laughs> in my mouth. Um, now that I, uh, now I'm going to do the, uh, now I can put whatever kind of eyeshadow or something on top of this? Yeah, so if that's what you've got around, you can take any eyeshadow palette that kind of has those, you know, black, gray, brown, reds, because we're going to start to the holes that you created from making the bridge. We're going to start coloring oh. those holes with the deeper colors to add oh, depth. Oh, I see. And make it look like it's under your skin. You know? I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. I think I should do one of these on my face, too. I think it would just be easier for me to do. Hold the phone. <laughs> will you um, will you warm this up again? Thank you so much. I want to do it on my face because I just think it'll be easier to see. Oh, here comes yeah. Elena. Well, I'm like, oh, here look. comes Elena. Then my face. Oh, hey, girl. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. But I'm going to practice on the one on my neck first. Okay. So I'm going to take this um, red. I've got this red. Do I have a red? I don't. Okay. So this is supposed to be like the skin that's underneath your burn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So it'll be kind of, there's going to be spots of it that are lighter. Maybe leave the parts of the gelatin that are the utmost, the most level out alone and just fill in kind of the under levels uh -oh. yeah and you can just kind of pat it on and you can blend it out but you don't have to use too too much pigment because we're gonna be yeah but even that right there looks like you've got a gash from the camera i'm doing it kind of <laughs> i mean you all should look up what lydia does because it is just fantastic no oh, thank you here yeah exactly right in the those folds of the gelatin right we're gonna right. pack the color right right i get it i get it okay this was a good practice one here but i think i'm gonna do it on my face now all right <laughs> That's the oh i think I'm coming <laughs> back with the all right elena let's do it one more time i'm gonna do it up here this time i think well i mean we don't do we have to be this do we have to be this close right now <laughs> <laughs> you can't see the it looks pretty good. It does. Yeah. I mean, it you haven't done good. that much. I and haven't like done if, it. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you're if you're at home and you're doing this again yeah. and you hate it, literally you can just kind of like you just roll peel it, it off. And you I can feel like you can it. have just a lot yeah. of fun doing this stuff. Um, yeah, gelatin is okay. really reusable, so it's really easy. If you ever have excess, you just let it harden again, and you can put in a little plastic baggie and save it for another time and just reheat it yeah. later when you need it. Reheat it when you need it. Reheat it when you need it. Okay, you create the bridge. There you go. You yep. create the, the bridge, and then you yep. you kind of have holes, I see. Yeah, so you're going to kind of make move your bridges around to kind of create little, like, you know, like honeycomb I kind see. of shape or circles or squares. I see. So it's easy for you to stick a small brush in and pack it with color as the underlayer. Okay, now I get it. Oh, I think I got some oh, holes here. That. Oh, I think I got some good holes here. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I got some good holes here. But I don't want to lose it, so I want to hold this underneath. <laughs> a little bit hold too on. long. Hold on. And I just got to keep it there. Okay, go. Roll the, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. All right. See, now I have better holes, but this one is, this is too thick. But see, I got a better hole here, and this is... This is great. Oh, my gosh. People are going to have so it's much fun. fun doing this. And you can customize it wherever you want. Practice with different yes. kinds of colors. You can do zombie. I do this with zombies, too, because it's a lot like rotting skin. So yes. if you change the color palette and instead of doing reds, purples, charcoals, and browns for yeah. normal skin, you're going to do, you know, the green, grays, like those gross mustard yes. yellow. I love mustard yellow, but you know. You know the yellow, I mean, you know, and the blue. I do, I know, and I know you love zombies. <laughs> I know you love it. I you do. do amazing I do. work. I have, I need other brushes, because I have some, like, yellow here. That yeah, yellow would be to... perfect. There's a lot of fatty layers in your skin. Oh, fatty layers. Oh, I forgot the yellow. translucent powder part, but yeah. Oh, that yellow really does actually help it look kind of gross. It adds it. And you can add the translucent powder now, yeah, too. The eyeshadow will kind of act the same, but you won't hit all of it with color. Got it. And if you have to adjust this, because I know gelatin is, like, quote-unquote flesh-toned, yeah. um, you can add coloring to the gelatin. Um, I've when seen you're other cooking people, it for different when you're cooking skin it, tones. Little things, yes, like flocking, or I know if you have at home and you... You don't have any of like the special effects stuff. You can add like a drop of the liquid drops foundation to it, and that'll yeah. start to change it. You just don't want to add too much because it will change your consistency and for your application. I got so it. You can do it and avoid having to go in and paint more to make it match got your it. skin. Got it. Got it. Got it. I'm gonna put some. There we um, go. I'm gonna put some red on my face too, like I'm it. burned. Oh, I like yep. this. Okay, this is a great. It all idea. starts to come together. And then when you got the goggles on your forehead, you're going to be unmistakably a man playing this. Gene <laughs> Wilder and Young Frankenstein, not silent. It's I, live. <laughs> I love, I love that movie so much. Young Frankenstein. It's one of my favorites for sure. I mean, I can watch so every Halloween movie though this quarantine, quite honestly. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Just yes. celebration. <laughs> absolutely as you should okay awesome so now i put the my my mat my scientist goggles back on and see now oh i see and then you now go the like this yay it works. <laughs> i'm burned i'm burned, She's burned. <laughs> jello this and is really so fun it is it's it's really, funny. really yeah. fun. Thank you so much, Lydia. Of I'm course. going to yeah. come yeah. to work from now on with just another layer of, of burns <laughs> all over me, and it is going to be so fun. This is awesome. Well, thank you so much yes. for the tutorial and all the tips. All the yes, tips and tricks. Makeup tips. Thank you <laughs> so much for joining us. You have to follow Lydia on social media. Did we? Did I already ask you your social media stuff? Because I follow you on no. social media, and you put up the coolest okay. stuff. It is so cool to see everything that you do. So tell Thank our you. audience what your social media is. Uh, you can find me at lydiamorales.mua. And then you can see all my cool creations and monsters and creatures there. Got it, got it, got it, got yeah. it, got it. 
Um, <laughs> th thank you so, so much. And we're going to have you on again for a longer segment later on. We're going to talk more about the science and special and uh, special makeup effects. Um, but until yes. then, goodbye. Yes, Happy STEM you. Day. Bye. See you soon. <laughs> Wait, you don't follow CBS Unstoppable on YouTube? How will you know when new videos drop? You better go subscribe before you miss a crazy STEM moment. Like me walking a shark or making a black hole in my backyard.